As with any creative project, the final versions of video games often differ wildly from the original concept, like how this video started out as a list about pictures of dogs and hats we saw on the internet until we realised that had nothing to do with video games. Whether the original concept was too technically demanding, not good-looking enough, or met with critical disapproval, gaming history is full of games which were barely recognisable from their original forms when they finally landed on shop shelves. Join us now as we look at some of our favourites. Games, right Andy, not dogs. Yes. Remember when 2011's Duke Nukem Forever was originally announced? Maybe not, because it's entirely possible to be a young adult human who wasn't even alive when the game originally started development. Duke Nukem Forever took about 15 years in total to develop, so it's hardly surprising that, over the course of that development, it changed dramatically. And I'm not just talking about changing dramatically from a game that everyone wanted to play to a game that no one wanted to play. The original version of Duke Nukem Forever was built using the Quake 2 engine before it switched to Unreal and was a much blockier, more rudimentary game. Damn, I make this look good. This first trailer, in which Duke engages in thrilling shootouts from the back of a moving truck, rides minecarts like Indiana Jones, and ducks low flying fighter jets, debuted at E3 back in 1998. For historical context, that's the same E3 at which Valve showed a near-final version of the original Half-Life, which came out later that very same year. The Duke Nukem game would take quite a bit longer, on the other hand. By E3 in 2001, the game had changed again, and at the time it was spectacular, looking far in advance of any other shooter around at the time. Detailed characters, destructible buildings, and rideable donkeys catapulted this to the top of gamers' most wanted lists. Gamers super into donkeys in 2001, I guess. But then, it went very quiet indeed. Until 2011, when we finally got to experience this exquisite train wreck of a game, which shared only minor themes and almost none of the exciting set pieces promised by the original trailers. It even managed to make the section where you were handed the keys to a monster truck boring by insisting you stop to fill it up with fuel every 30 seconds. But hey, at least you could pick up feces. What the hell? 15 years well spent, guys. We are starting to see some great games come back to the map, but this is one of the coolest I've ever seen. We might think of Xbox and first-person shooter series Halo as being as inseparable as Master Chief and his power armor, which, to the best of our knowledge, he wears to bed. What, you think Master Chief has pajamas? You're dreaming. The first ever trailer for what would become the first Halo game, however, gives us a glimpse of what could have been. A surreal parallel universe where Halo was a third-person shooter that launched on Mac computers. Weird, I know. Weirder than Master Chief in footy pyjamas, which sounds adorable, but weird, right? Weird. Not okay. It's just... I mean, it's not okay, is it? It's just... No, no, it's weird. It's weird! This game is going to ship early next year from Bungie, and this is the first time anybody has ever seen it. It's the first time they've debuted it. The reveal trailer was unveiled 18 years ago at the Mac World Trade Show in 1999, back when the late, great Steve Jobs brought developer Bungie on stage, and Comic Sans was considered an acceptable font. Look at the state of that. It was a different time. Halo is the name of this game, and we're going to see, for the first time, Halo. Well, in this very early stage of development, when Halo was announced for Macs and PCs, the creators of Halo envisaged an ambitious third-person game in which two factions of humans and not-humans were fighting on a single ring world. This proto-Halo promised a huge map and online play, and at the time the trailer blew everyone away with its advanced graphics. Much of the trailer depicted a kind of sci-fi car chase, which ends with one Spartan sticking up an elite while another steals his ride. As alien as the idea of Halo 1 being a third-person shooter is, though, this 18-year-old trailer did establish what would become Halo's familiar visual style and iconic score. <laughs> However, 
However, the following year, Microsoft bought Bungie, and the year after that, in 2001, the game launched as Halo Combat Evolved on the original Xbox, with an entirely different plot and no online play because Xbox Live wasn't even a thing yet. Recon reporting. Hostiles have been neutralized. Say again, over. The drop zone is clear. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go and see about some Master Chief pajama fan art. You know, Team Fortress 2, it's the game that looks like a Pixar movie, only everyone's trying to kill each other. And there are hats. Valve's all-conquering and now free-to-play shooter has evolved plenty since it was first released as part of the Orange Box back in 2007. They've added game modes, a fleshed-out backstory, and so many hats. But it hasn't changed as much as it did between the first trailer and the eventual release. The first concept for TF2, back when it was Team Fortress 2 Brotherhood of Arms, was a more gritty, realistic war setting. It had character models that looked like actual soldiers, a proper hierarchy of commanded matches, and parachute drops over enemy territory. Which all sounds a bit too much like having an actual job in the actual army, to me. What, was there a boot polishing minigame too? There were some neat ideas in there, including cooperative mounted guns where one player fed the belt while the other fired. Still, a gritty modern war setting with all the requisite seriousness seems completely at odds with a game about dashing into an enemy fortress disguised as an enemy pyro and stabbing someone in the back in order to help steal a flag. <laughs> Our verdict? Too much pathos, not enough hats. So, there I am. King. King of all the land. Who'd have thought that? Conker's Bad Fur Day is an N64 platformer from Banjo-Kazooie developer Rare, and it's remembered for being swearier than a Gordon Ramsay cameo in Deadwood. Why is it everybody so offensive around here? But that wasn't always the case. When Conker's first video game outing was initially announced in 1997, it was under the title Conker's Quest, which was later changed to 12 Tales Conker 64, and was a much cutesier adventure starring an adorable Conker who wore lots of little adorable hats, oh my god! At this point, the game was to be a mix of action and strategy, but still aimed at family audiences, because look, it's a cute squirrel on a unicycle. That didn't go down super well with the game's press at the time, who felt that 12 Tales Conquer 64 didn't do enough to differentiate itself from Banjo-Kazooie, and that the family-friendly nature of the game was holding it back. It was at this point that Rare went back to the drawing board and decided that if people hated cute squirrels so much, they were going to create the least cute squirrel that had ever existed. That's how we got the Conquer we all know today who spends much of his time drunk. Oh, I don't feel so good now. <laughs> You guys enjoy yourself and all that, and I'll probably see you sometime next week. Fighting bosses like the Great Mighty Poo? Sprite! I am the Great Mighty Poo, and I'm going to throw my sh at you. I guess so. And uh, making mice fart themselves to death. Oh! <laughs> uh -oh. Needless to say, that was the more popular choice. Unless you're a mouse, of course. <laughs> it was right before I was to take on my duties of protecting the president's daughter when she was abducted. That's the ultimate reason I'm in this lonely and rural part of Europe. Now considered an all-time classic, Resident Evil 4 went through more revisions during its development than the T-Virus. I believe in you, Umbrella. Gonna get that formula right one day. Ooh, swing and a miss. After Resident Evil 3 in 1999, Capcom wanted to do something different with the series, so loads of different ideas were considered for Resident Evil 4. One popular early design introduced new characters Tony Redgrave and his twin brother Virgil. These twins had become superhumans thanks to Umbrella's G-Virus and were the sons of Oswell E. Spencer, one of the founders of Umbrella. The Wesker children were entrusted with endless potential. Of them, only one survived. This project, headed by Bayonetta director Hideki Kamiya, was intended to be a much more cool and stylish version of Resident Evil, which clashed with Capcom's ideas of Resident Evil as a survival horror franchise. Eventually, it was decided to make the project a whole other new game, so the work done up to that point was spun off into a little game we now know as Devil May Cry. You're the man who lost a mother and a brother to evil 20 years ago. The son of the legendary Dark Knight Sparta, Mr. Dante. 
The name Spencer was changed to Sparta, they added a bunch of demons, and Tony became Dante. Because honestly, can you imagine a stylish action game with a main character called Tony? With that out of the way, work began on versions of Resident Evil 4 that revolved around Leon Kennedy searching for the source of the progenitor virus. The earliest version, depicted in this first proper trailer for Resident Evil 4, aka Biohazard 4, was set in a castle and later an airship, and included sections where Leon would become possessed. Sure, there was also to be a subplot starring a female survivor and her dog, though this idea was later spun off into the survival horror game Haunting Ground. <laughs> Though we only got a glimpse of that version of Resident Evil 4, we saw a lot more of the next version of the game in this second trailer, which featured a lot more ghostly supernatural horror, like these possessed suits of armour and this still living deer head. To be honest, I'd be annoyed if someone turned me into a wall decoration. From what we can tell, these spooky elements sprung from Leon having hallucinations after being infected with a virus, which allowed for much more traditional horror tropes. These included being attacked by knife-wielding dolls, <laughs> and a new antagonist known as Hookman, a man with, yes, a hook. This version of the game still maintained the fixed camera perspectives of Resident Evil, something the eventual final version of Resident Evil 4 would do away with, in favour of an over-the-shoulder perspective that only appears in this version when Leon draws his weapon. Reports say this version of Resident Evil 4 was close to 50% complete before Capcom scrapped it in favour of what was actually released as Resident Evil 4 in 2005. One element was consistent across all versions of the game, so we have to assume that it must be the most vital part of Resident Evil 4, and that part was Leon's jacket. Change whatever you want, that thing is staying. Well, reports of wild animal attacks in this area are not unheard of. Over the last week, the county sheriff's department has been experiencing a deluge of such reports. Back in 2010, 2K Games revealed an intriguing concept for its established XCOM franchise. Instead of a turn-based strategy game like the rest of the series, though, it was a first-person horror shooter designed by the team behind Bioshock 2 and set in the 1950s. It pitted the newly formed XCOM against a breed of evil aliens that travelled in weird geometric craft, could possess hard-working American folks, and manifested as icky black goop. Die! Instead of commanding your troops from a dispassionate, godlike perspective, you were down on the ground in first-person combat alongside two squadmates, getting your immaculate 50 suit and fedora all dirty. <laughs> it's a strategy game in as much as the strategy is shoot all the things. When the game finally arrived three years later in 2013, renamed The Bureau XCOM Declassified, it was a third-person shooter, featured completely different aliens and weapons, and was set a whole decade later in the 1960s, oh, when they put all the strategy stuff back in. So you now have to tell other people to shoot all the things. The Bureau actually did a good job of blending Gears of War style cover shooting with on-the-fly squad commands and even had a branching narrative with conversation options. Why did you stop me? What the hell were you thinking? I was thinking that I just saved your life. You ambushed a four-star general. How do you expect me to react? But very few people bought it, obviously. Probably because of all the strategy stuff. In a final twist of the tale, though, by cosmic coincidence, we did eventually get a first-person game in which you face bizarre shape-shifting monsters made of animated black goo. It's just, it was set in space, and it wasn't made by 2K. And it was called Prey. It was just a job! They just gave me a picture and told me to provide a body. That's all it was, a dump job! They isn't good enough. Who were you working for? Splinter Cell Conviction is the sixth game in the long-running series about Sam Fisher, a man so stealthy he could be standing behind you right now and you wouldn't even know. He's behind me, isn't he? Ha-ha! <laughs> no, I, I knew he wasn't behind me. 
But when Splinter Cell Conviction was first announced at an event held by publisher Ubisoft in 2007, it looked very different to the game we finally got in 2010. For a start, Sam looked a bit like he'd spent the years since Splinter Cell Double Agent sleeping on a park bench. And the gameplay Ubisoft showed off made it look more like a sequel to Final Fight than a stealth game, with Sam running around a park battering people with whatever he could lay his hands on, from cafe tables to menu boards to other people. In this early gameplay, Sam also appears to have developed a deep and abiding hatred of hot dog carts. To be fair, some of this Bourne-style approach to violence did make it into the final version of Splinter Cell Conviction, with Sam using everything including the kitchen sink against his enemies. But the final version of Conviction also introduced a bunch of new stealth gameplay options, including the last known position marker to let you know where enemies thought you were, Hold still and, die. and the mark and execute skill, which allowed Sam to shoot multiple enemies in quick succession. Plus, Sam had scrubbed up, so he now looked like a catalogue model for a brand of rugged outdoors wear. Nice outfit, Sam. What was L.L. Bean having a sale? He's behind me, isn't he? Thanks for watching this video about games that changed dramatically from their original showings. Uh, if you want to click on one of these two pictures of dogs in hats, that will take you through to... What? Oh, sorry, I forgot we changed that. There are actually videos that you can click. Uh, up here is one from us, down here is one from Outside Extra. And you can subscribe to our channel by clicking on this. Are we definitely not doing the dogs? Next time, next time. <laughs>